I'm Ryan Craig. I'm the Director of Student Programs at the Berkeley Center here at Georgetown. And this year, our symposium features our 10 graduating seniors completing their religion, ethics, and world affairs minors or certificates. We broke this up into two roundtables. If you were not able to join us for the first roundtable, it will be posted on our website later, so you can go back and look at the other students' poster presentations. But this, this afternoon's presentation features all students who were part of Father Christensen's class last fall. So you're all in the same boat. You're, hopefully your research is still kind of fresh in your minds and not completely in the cobwebs of your minds, but I know you're all focusing on other things and trying to finish up and graduate. So it's okay if things are a little rusty. To start us off this afternoon, Raina is gonna um, kick us off and she is majoring in government with a minor in Rewa and she'll be sharing with us on the decline of democracy, secularization and minority rights in India. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Craig, for that introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the topic of my presentation today um, is on the decline of democracy, secularization, and minority of rights in India today. Um, as a practicing Hindu Indian American, I chose to focus on this topic as a whole because of my personal connections on the issue, as well as my academic background. As a government major, uh, and a Rewa minor. The intersection of Indian politics with Hindu religious nationalism has always fascinated me. And throughout my research, I was able to conduct a deeper analysis of India at its conception in comparison to the nation it is today. I chose to concentrate on the three areas of democracy, secularization, and minority rights because I believe them to be some of the most critically significant pillars of the Indian constitution that were of utmost importance upon independence and the partition of India in 1947. The aim of my research was to determine whether those fundamental pillars of democracy, secularization, and the protection of minority rights in India dwindled as a direct result of the election of the Bharatiya Janata Party, better known as the BJP Party, and their rise to power and the rise of Hindu nationalism. The democracy of India is expansive by nature uh, in terms of size and social cleavages based on caste, religion, language, and ethnicity. The Constitution of India declared the nation to be a secular state that protects religious freedoms and ethnic diversity. However, the election of the BJP party in 2014 has promoted a dramatic rise in Hindu nationalism that directly contradicts the notion of secularization. This ideological wave has weakened secularization in India by expanding the growth of xenophobic nationalism and threats to religious minorities. So in order to investigate the decline of the three pillars, um, I studied a number of primary and secondary sources. The primary sources consisted of uh, publications, speeches, and articles written by leaders of minority groups in India. And then the other sources that I studied consisted of peer-reviewed academic journals on related issues in India and the constitution of India as well. So in my research, I found several key pieces of information to support my argument of the decline of the three pillars. Um, I've listed my five key findings on the poster, but for the sake of time, I will explain two of my findings more in depth. Firstly, I found that the constitutional design and legal regime concurrently formalizes the Indian democratic and secular state while giving privilege and interests, um, while giving privileges to the interests of the Hindu majority, as well as undermining all of the three fundamental pillars. Several constitutional provisions, laws, including um, anti-conversion laws and cow protection legislation incite anti-minority sentiment. Um, for example, Article 25 of the Constitution enables the state to provide for the social welfare and reform of Hindu religious institutions, um, giving a number of direct principles of state policy, including the prohibition of the slaughter of cows and calves, which is a direct affirmation um, of the preferences of the Hindu majority. Additionally, the anti-conversion laws originated during the British colonial period and uh, only apply to conversion from original religion. So in other words, uh, the laws that restrict conversions out of Hinduism are very strict, but they also have laws that promote and encourage conversions into it. Another key finding that I produced was that with BJP leadership, the promotion and tolerance of attacks on women, Muslims, Christians, and Dalits, and lower caste in Hindu society has increased. This can be attributed to uh, Prime Minister Modi's promotion of Hindu nationalist ideology to strengthen the executive branch, which has given more rise to uh, militant Hindu nationalist organizations. The government has been able to curb dissent on the ground that it threatens national stability by invoking section uh, 124A of the constitution that outlaws sedition um, and also outlawing criminal conspiracy of the Indian penal code. 
the police frequently are able to harass government critics by arresting them under this anti-sedition law. Uh, the police force is biased against Muslims because statistically it is predominantly Hindu composition and because it is protected by the higher functionaries uh, from being punished for crimes of commission and omission. So essentially it's an endless cycle because police officers are beholden to politicians uh, for professional advancement and therefore are more likely to be politically strategic than law abiding. My findings are important because it shows that in India, the protection of democracy and religious freedoms and minority rights are very closely intertwined. Although India has never been a purely secular country uh, in its history, despite its intentions, as Hindu nationalism continues to rise, it poses a threat to democracy. The target of Hindu nationalism are only getting larger and it's bigger than just religious minorities of Christians, Sikhs and Muslims. They are women, they are lower castes and they are critics of the ideology altogether. To go on to further tolerate these injustices faced by these communities is an act of promise to only protect the privileges and interests of Hindus and not all of India's population today. So if India is to continue to classify itself as a democratic and secular nation, it must recognize the struggles of all of the communities, not just the communities that further the most political interests and conform to the majority identity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you, you really approved the paper since I saw it last and I'm grateful for that. Uh, I, I want to ask about the RSS. Uh, did, did, did Modi have relations when he was uh, uh, a, a state minister uh, to the RSS uh, and in, uh, independent of the PJP or, or not? Um, I don't, uh, in my research, I haven't come across that, um, but I definitely would say that it was definitely inspired by a lot of the ideology that he follows today. Um, and has promoted as a political party, um, different branches of it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Thanks, we have a question in the chat. Um, when you say the police force is racist, is there clear evidence for that and in what sources? Yeah, definitely. Um, so statistically, uh, police forces uh, throughout my research have been predominantly on the Hindu side um, and that is, statistically showing with the support of the increase of attacks on um, different minority communities. And I say this, and I mentioned it before, because they're able to get away because uh, police tend to get into power number one and become commissioners through political appointment. So they continue to do so. As long as Hindu uh, nationalists are in power, they're gonna continue to appoint Hindu uh, commissioners and the cycle perpetuates. And then as a result, the tolerance of attacks on women, lower castes, religious minorities continues. Um, and I see a, a follow-up question, any analogies to racial disparities in the USA? And uh, that's very interesting because I found a lot in my search that, um, and a side tangent, I also researched Hindu Indian American communities and surprisingly in, two, in the 2016 election, um, they, vo they voted overwhelmingly conservative which kind of speaks to their alignment uh, against Islamic, so-called Islamic extremists, but um, also their anti-sentiment towards uh, Pakistani Muslims and the conflicts that have occurred there. Very interesting. Any other questions, Lorena? Well, thank you so much. That was a great way to start us off. I appreciate that. Um, we'll go next to Helena. I will get you spotlighted. So Haley is studying psychology with a double major in or double minor in religion, ethics, world affairs, and environmental studies. And her project is on climate change, resources, and refugees, the multifaceted nature of displaced people in a modernized world, and the case of the Rohingya in Myanmar and Bangladesh. Hi guys, I'm Hallie. Um, so I am really passionate about environmental issues. I'm going to law school for that next year. So I really appreciate Father Christensen letting me kind of incorporate that into my rewa minor. Um, this is kind of part one of two. So this was for rewa, and then my next thesis is um, next Friday, and that compares the case of the Rohingya to the people of Tuvalu, who are solely climate refugees. Um, but basically, I wanted to examine kind of, obviously, everyone knows the Rohingya are, you know, religiously persecuted. Um, they're a Muslim ethnic minority that exists in Myanmar. There's, you know, a bunch of stuff in the press about the Rohingya refugee crisis. Um, but I really wanted to look into it and see if there were kind of other factors at play, um, including climate change that possibly could have contributed to their flight. 
Um, and I guess my overall kind of like goal of this paper was to demonstrate that, you know, in a modern world, there are so many different drivers of migration, including climate change. Um, but for the Rohingya in particular, it's religious persecution, climate change, um, environmental aspects, and also economic development by foreign countries that push them to flee from um, Myanmar to Bangladesh. Um, and I don't really cover as much the economic development piece on my poster because it's very small, but the paper goes very in detail. Basically, there's a bunch of foreign investments from China and oil development from the Gulf states that's kind of um, exacerbated by climate change, which I'll go into in a second. Um, so I kind of started off by looking at Myanmar as a state, their existing vulnerability, and they actually rank super high on a bunch of um, climate change indices, which means they're extremely susceptible to climate change. Um, one like very pertinent index I found was that um, they rank very high on the index for risk management, which measures kind of a country's um, susceptibility to committing humanitarian crises, crises that are related to climate change. Um, and they rank 12th out of 192 countries on that. So obviously very high, which just indicates that they're very susceptible to committing humanitarian crises and kind of like persecuting different groups as a result of climate change. Um, and then I kind of started to examine the Rohingya's targets. You know, Professor Christensen was like, oh, like Hallie, you need to like make this argument. Like how is not just Myanmar as a whole, but the actual Rohingya people impacted by climate change. And so they primarily exist in this region called the Rakhine State. Um, at its peak, it was 98% Rohingya, the population there. Um, and so the first thing that the Myanmar's government does specifically to the Rohingya is they um, have blocked kind of climate change like warnings about natural disasters. So they actually broadcast like when, you know, a cyclone's coming, they broadcast it on television in a language that the Rohingya people don't know. And so they're basically that, you know, less prepared for like an incoming cyclone. Um, in addition, so there was another study called the Building Resilience and Adaptation to Climate Extremes and Disasters study. And it found that low income and like rural populations, which the Rohingya are both rural and low income, um, were more susceptible to not being informed um, about climate change. And only one third of these populations felt prepared to deal with climate change impacts compared to the Myanmarese like nationwide average of two thirds. Um, and so, also, there's kind of a report by the UN that talks about, like, it acknowledges um, climate change as a, like, legitimate reason for Rohingya flight. Um, so then I kind of go into, like, erosion and mangrove degradation of the Rakhine state, which is on the coast of Myanmar. So it's very susceptible to erosion. Um, so basically also as well, so 68% of the population in the Rakhine, which again was, has very high, or at least had very high um, Rohingya populations, um, they live in thatched roof housing, which is extremely vulnerable to storms. Um, there's also measurable kind of impacts of erosion. So um, where the rivers are, it's like been shown to erode by 20 to 60 feet per year. And the Georgia Institute of Technology actually did a study um, and they found that um, over the course of 15 years, like agricultural tracts lost around four acres, which is obviously a significant amount. And after one cyclone in 2008, they found that the shorelines had eroded 100 meters horizontally. And so the Rohingya are kind of an agriculturally based people. And so when they're losing this land, it's not just that the land that they live on is eroding away, but literally their livelihood is eroding away out from under them. Um, and so to kind of demonstrate, take more of you know a case study of the case study, so to speak, um, I looked at uh, one particular cyclone in 2015, um, and this, you know, widely impacted Myanmar as a whole, but also the Rakhine state in particular. Um, the World Bank mo was monitoring the situation and found that the inability to recover agricultural livelihood in the Rakhine was a significant reason for people fleeing. Um, and then I also kind of looked into the flooding and out migration to Bangladesh, which is the largest Rohingya refugee camps. Um, and my paper also goes more into the um, effects of climate change on the refugees actually in the camps there. Um, but for like the poster, you know, I have to keep it kind of short, but um, basically like there hasn't been a cyclone since then. And the um, kind of incoming Rohingyas into the Bangladesh refugee camps has kind of dropped off to kind of use that to make the argument that it's possible that maybe the fact that there were no cyclones driving people out is, you know, indicates that maybe cyclones were a reason for all the people kind of fleeing originally. Um, 
And then just to go into a little bit of like my analysis of international law, um, I argue that the 1951 Refugee Convention needs to be rewritten just because climate change and, you know, other impacts too that refugees or people displaced today face um, were not apparent back then and they need to be incorporated. And then obviously international law is fairly tenuous with, you know, treaties not really having any sort of accountability mechanism. But I do talk about the 2018 Global Refugee Compact and the Sustainable Development Goals and kind of outline a framework by which, you know, the kind of wording and um, kind of uh, treaties that those things hold countries to, how that could be kind of like employed to coax countries to open their borders if, you know, a large scale climate refugee um, crisis was to occur. And then I guess like that's pretty much all I have to say on this, but it's kind of like a stay tuned for like, next week, because I think it's really interesting even to see this case laid out in parallel to the people of Tuvalu who are basically exclusively climate refugees and to see kind of how many different factors they share in their cases. And I think that's really interesting. So I think it, it's just important because like going forward, like refugees, like increasingly are driven out by multiple factors and there's really a need for this protection and responsibility by other countries. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. We don't have much time for questions. I let you go a little over. So maybe one question for Hallie. Oh, we have so many hands. Catherine, I'll let you take the question. Um, well, your argument about the Rohingya in Rakhine State sort of turns a lot of history and conventional wisdom on its head. But let's take another dimension, uh, which is if you had to recommend to the Secretary General how to update the refugee definition so that it would take climate change into account, how would you start on that? What kind of process? Yeah, so I, I think the process is more important than the actual detail. Yeah. So I, in my paper, I like looked into a lot of different frameworks that could be used or that should be used rather, because it is kind of this almost, it becomes almost like an ethical question, like who is responsible for these people that are, you know, displaced because, you know, here in the US we're, you know, causing sea level rise and emitting, you know, more kind of greenhouse gases than our share. So, and that's kind of having impacts on the other side of the world. Um, so in my opinion, I think like where we would start is kind of, like somehow, I guess, economically, like total up like different countries emissions and environmental impacts, and then kind of do like a like proportionate like, like the US like say we emit like, like 30% of the world's like carbon, we would have to take then 30% of the world's climate refugees, or something like that. So I think that strategy is like more fair with one caveat, I think like developing countries should not really have to take um, as many, like be responsible for as many refugees. Cause obviously like they're still in the phase of developing. So they're like, they don't have as um, kind of good infrastructure that can like be more efficient in terms of climate change. And also my paper examines this more, but in Bangladesh, they're really overwhelmed by the refugees right now. And it's almost like making it harder for them to combat climate change on this other level because they're just dealing with like getting food and healthcare and basic services to the refugees. So I think like really the burden there lies on developing or sorry, developed countries, you know, with that infrastructure and the kind of economy to take in these people, if that makes sense. Thanks so much for your paper and for the questions. If you did not get a chance to ask your question, please feel free to put it in the chat and maybe um, you can look, take a look at those um, after we move on. So our next participant is gonna be Amarisa and we get her spotlighted and share a little bit about her. So she is majoring in government in French and minoring in Rewa. And she's examining, should faith-based organizations be involved in relief aid? a look at FBO relief initiatives for Syrian refugee communities in Lebanon. Thank you, Dr. Craig, for that introduction. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, so for my project, um, I chose to look at the role of faith-based organizations in um, providing relief aid to Syrian refugee communities in Lebanon. Um, and my inspiration for this project actually came 
um, from a USAID conference on religion and international development that I was able to attend um, last semester. Um, Father Drew shared the information with our class and professor, professor Marshall helped me get signed up and I was able to attend a few sessions um, in between classes and everything. And so um, I think more than anything, this, co this conference really got me just thinking kind of generally about the role of FBOs in development and relief aid, um, which ultimately led me to want to pursue this project. Um, and so in terms of the research itself, um, starting off, um, I really wanted to answer the question of or, or look at the question of should FBOs be involved in relief aid? Um, and if so, why and in what capacity? Um, so for the purposes of my paper, um, I, I wanted to first um, make sure I had a very clear definition of what kind of FBOs I was looking at. So um, I defined them as organizations with religious motivation in their founding or missions, whose central aims are not proselytization and who respect broader liberal international human rights frameworks. Um, so, um, after kind of learning more about FBOs as a whole, I turned to the question of um, why FBOs in Lebanon. Um, and essentially my argument here is that particularly in places like Lebanon, um, where civil society organizations are, are extremely instrumental in responding to crises, um, largely often as a result of the failure of the state to respond, and also where um, religiosity is really woven into the fabric of the society, both um, through their political structure, as well as through just social identification, um, FBOs can be really important actors um, in, in responding to crises and also in bridging societal divides between um, refugees and local communities. Um, so kind of looking after looking at the Lebanese context as a whole, I wanted to look at the work of two specific um, FBOs in Lebanon. So I chose to look at um, one Christian and one Muslim FBO. So I looked at the International Orthodox Christian Charities, um, IOCC, and Islamic Relief Worldwide. And in order to measure kind of the efficacy of these two FBOs, um, I wanted kind of a frame, to use kind of a framework. Um, and so I turned to the fundamental assumptions of humanitarian assistance laid out in the code of conduct for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and NGOs in disaster relief. So specifically principles one, two, and three of this code, um, which look at ensuring the humanitarian imperative is met um, ensuring universality of aid and ensuring impartiality of aid. So those were kind of the three principles that I um, used to assess the work of IOCC and Islamic Relief. Um, so as an example, in their mission statement, um, IOCC expresses a commitment to, quote, offer re emergency relief and development, program development programs to those in need worldwide without discrimination and to fulfill a humanitarian mission while simultaneously helping to create a new awareness across the categories that have divided humanity. Um, and for Islamic Relief as well, um, their mission statement describes their commitment to, quote, provide relief and development aid to all individuals, regardless of gender, race, or religion, and to empower individuals in their communities and give them a voice in the world. So um, I think these, these two sections from their mission statement really capture their interpretation of the humanitarian imperative and impartiality and universality as laid out in the IRC code of conduct. Um, and their programs as well, um, they, they both have a broad array of programs that they're, they're um, doing to aid communities in Lebanon, um, but they're all guided by program frameworks laid out in the Lebanon, Lebanon response plan, um, which they're both partners of and um, which was created as a collaborative effort um, to address the Syrian refugee crisis. So um, involving the government of Lebanon um, the UN, UNHCR, um, FBOs, as well as NFBOs. Um, so through the language that these two FBOs use in their mission statements, as well as this framework um, that they're partners um, of for their programs, um, I came to the conclusion that these could be examples of um, ways that FBOs can be committed to humanitarian principles laid out in the IRC code of conduct, while still um, maintaining a commitment to their respective religious traditions. Um, so that was kind of an overview of my project, but um, yeah, I would be happy to take any questions. Hi, uh, Marisa. First, nice to see you here. Um, you, it seems to me that um, there is a difference between local religious organizations that are more actually based on community and recognition of the political role of some religious communities. And, and Islamic relief is not one of those. Islamic relief is global, right? Mm -hmm. So the, in your work, did you see how Islamic relief works with, I don't know, Sunni religious communities in Lebanon? 
um, because my understanding is there are some resistance from the religious local communities to the refugee presence. So it's very interesting to me that you look at the faith-based organization uh, while what you are saying is in fact that these faith-based organizations are held from outside, not really from the Lebanese point of view. So I don't know what you find really on that. I wanted you to, to, to tell us just a little more. Yeah, um, so, so from some of my um, research, I did find that um, just in, in terms of, um, I guess, arguments for why faith-based organizations can be effective is that they do have connections to um, local faith communities. Um, and so um, I know often they tend to kind of work through those communities to actually distribute aid. And, um, and so um, in terms of your question, I think um, I, something I that I wasn't, I didn't have access to that I think would have been really beneficial here would be kind of um, on the ground testimonies of maybe from um, Sunni communities in Lebanon on, on kind of how they feel that the, the aid was distributed and if they felt that it um, was accessible to all. So that would that would definitely be something that um, for the future I, I would hope to incorporate um, is actual testimonies from the people receiving the aid. Um, but in terms of kind of what I was trying to do, I was trying to look at um, the mission of the organizations and see that they, they are at least expressing their commitment to um, providing aid to um, individuals of all religious backgrounds, whether or not, that, that's not to say that they always did that, there might've been situations where they didn't, but um, uh, yeah, given, I guess, the information I had access to, um, that was kind of, I was trying to look at how they try to express their commitment to um, supporting these humanitarian aims while also um, maintaining that connection to a religious tradition. And um, I know specifically, um, in the case of IOCC working through um, on the like communities on the ground to actually distribute the aid. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely space for, for more, um, more research there and um, something I would definitely consider. Okay, we'll move on to our next presenter. If we have time at the end, we'll come back to everyone if we, if we have some time to offer more questions at the end. So for now, we'll turn to Catherine Murphy who's studying history with a concentration in Russian and Eastern Europe and double minoring in justice and peace studies and religion, ethics, and world affairs. And let me get you spotlighted. She is going to share her project on the role of religion in the rise and decline of authoritarian governments in Eastern Europe, Hungary, Poland, and Ukraine. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so my uh, thesis focused on Hungary, Poland, and Ukraine, uh, particularly the leaders of those countries. So for Hungary, that is Viktor Orban of the Fides Party. Also, I apologize if I mispronounce anything in this presentation. I will. <laughs> but, um, so Fides Party is a right-wing populist nationalist party. Um, he's the de facto dictator of Hungary, has been since 2010. Uh, then for Poland, there's Jaroslaw Kaczynski of the Law and Justice Party, which is another right-wing nationalist and conservative and populist party. Um, he's the head of the party and technically deputy prime minister, um, but he's been called the chief of state because of his influence over the country, which like extends beyond his like technical role. Um, and then thirdly, there is Ukraine, uh, which is led by President Volodymyr Zelensky of the Servant of the People Party which is a centrist party. And interestingly, interestingly enough, the name of a TV show that in which Zelensky portrayed a teacher who was all of a sudden elected president of Ukraine. So what he is now. Um, unlike the other two, he's considered a liberalizing force and supports Euro integration, um, especially considering Russia's ongoing like, invasion of Ukraine. Um, I argued that in Hungary and Poland, religion is employed as a guise for xenophobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, and misogyny. Likewise, influential government figures have aligned themselves with churches um, in their respective countries to consolidate their power. However, in Ukraine, a country in a horrible war and work and making increasing strides towards democracy, religion has become a symbol and cause of nationalism, much like in Hungary and Poland, 
but contrastingly, it's become a more peaceful and harmonious version, uh, promoting unity within said country. Uh, my methodology include looking at primary sources such as speeches, official publications, and quotes given to reporters by the leaders um, and other officials affiliated with them. I read newspaper articles and scholarly peer-reviewed pieces on the current situation in these countries. So like a little bit of a summary, um, Orban has garnered support for his rule, partly through claiming that he is promoting, uh, protecting like Christian democracy. Uh, for example, Orban in a speech to a domestic audience declared, in Europe today is forbidden to speak the truth, is forbidden to say that today we are not witnessing the arrival of refugees, but Europe being threatened by mass migration, is forbidden to say that tens of millions are ready to set out in our direction, is forbidden to say that immigration brings crime and terrorism to our countries, is forbidden to say that masses of people coming from different civilizations pose a threat to our way of life, our customs, and our Christian traditions. Um, it's forbidden to say that instead of integrating those who have arrived here earlier, have built a world of their own with their own laws and ideals, which is forcing apart the thousand-year-old structure of Europe. So rather horrifying stuff, but what he's using to consolidate power um, because he's like fighting for the Hungarian people. Likewise, in Poland, the Law and Justice Party has used religion as a justification for their policies, particularly their attacks on the the judiciary press and like civil liberties, the Polish people. Kaczynski has asserted that to call into question the position of the Catholic Church is a non-patriotic act regardless of the person's beliefs. Um, he has pledged to shut Polish borders to um, a alleged like 100,000 Muslim refugees who he said would seek to impose Sharia law on the country. Um, Furthermore, on his anti-LGBTQ legislation, Kaczynski claimed it's not about individuals, it's about ideology. Those people who demonstrate their sexuality openly are in effect attacking the church. I'm a believer and a practicing person like most Poles. We've been baptized and we are believers, therefore our goal is salvation. You achieve salvation by living a holy life in line with the Ten Commandments. The well-being of our children and grown children is at stake because the equality movement blasphemizes things we hold sacred. Uh, then when protests erupted due to Allah's party proposed that would essentially ban all abortion in, a Pol in Poland, he called on Poles to defend Poland, defend patriotism, defend the Polish churches, directly linking all of them together and his legislation. Uh, furthermore, and lastly, unlike Hungary and Poland, Ukraine has become less authoritarian and more liberal. Former President Viktor Yanukovych was toppled in February 2014 by popular protests known as Maidenden. Religion through the like long protests played an important role, particularly in keeping the protests peaceful. Religious services were commonly held and religious figures were prominent participants. At times they would stand between the police and the protesters, like averting violence. However, um, some protesters were killed and they're now known as like the Heavenly Hundred. Funerals for the victims were performed by clergymen and other religious figures um, who were there at the maiden protests. Um, meanwhile, Zelensky is Ukraine's first Jewish president, which highlights the nation's increased religious tolerance, especially in a state with a history of pogroms. Um, he also supported the creation of independent Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is now the largest religious organization in Ukraine, uh, breaking from the Russian Orthodox Church, which illustrates this connection between nationalism and religion. Um, okay, that about sums it up. Sorry if I went a little long. Um, thank you. Questions? Thanks, Catherine. Uh, I have a question about Ukraine. There was great solidarity, as you explained, among the various religions factions, except for the one loyal to Moscow. Uh, during the Maidan events and in, in, in immediate years of after after uh, reasserting their independence, uh, I'm wondering have have uh, have, have the, the have the Ukrainian Orthodox and the Ukrainian Catholics developed any kind of theology of tolerance in in the subsequent periods that they have other than political reasons for being tolerant to one another or to um. the Jews, for that matter. I'm sorry, do you mean like specifically towards other religions within yes. Ukraine? Um, yeah. I'm not exactly sure about like official doctrine, but mm -hmm. there does seem to be this unity within Ukraine that's developed, particularly because of this invasion of Russia, 
where it's like we are all in this together and like lots of like religious talk of like harmony and unity and like solidarity together against this like other force which is kind of coming for Ukraine mm -hmm. um and so like from what I've seen from speeches and like sermons and stuff like that yes but I don't know if there's official doctrine okay thank you Okay, well, we'll move on to Sam, but it looks like we're going to have time at the end. So if you want to think about all of the presentations you've seen and offer up some questions in the chat, we can come back to those at the very end. Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm going to highlight Sam. And there we go. So Sam Shapiro is our last presenter today. He is studying international politics with a certificate in religion, ethics, and world affairs. And he's going to be sharing his project on the scourge of sectarianism in the modern Middle East, a path forward through diplomacy. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Um, so my project is an analysis of the historical origins, uh, the contemporary circumstances, and possible ways to move forward um, from what has become over the past couple of decades, the defining struggle, at least internally um, in the Muslim world, the sectarian strife between Sunni and Shia. Um, I was initially drawn to sectarianism as a topic because I was beginning to think about what to write on as the Abraham Accords were being signed. Uh, and most of the coverage in the United States concerned what the Accords meant for Israel or for President Trump. Um, but I was much more interested in the impact that the Accords would have on intra-Arab relations. Um, you know, the issue of Israel is really emblematic, I think, uh, of the larger trends in the Muslim world, the deals between Bahrain, the UAE, and then subsequently Sudan and Morocco, uh, and Israel represent the fissure of the Arab world along sectarian lines um, on yet another issue on which it used to speak with a unified voice. Um, so analyzing the, the origins of the theological schism exposes the fact that even from its opening moments, the sectarian conflict has always been both religious and political in nature. The Sunni Shia schism arose over the question of you know, who would be the immediate political successor to the Prophet Muhammad upon his death, following the assassination of Hussein, the, the third Shia Imam uh, in the Sunni Abbasid leadership in the 700s, was terrified that his continued status as a martyr and the persistent persecution of Shiite populations would lead to an uprising against the regime. Um, the Abbasid caliphs were concerned about the Shia in regards to the social cleavage they provided, um, not because of their theological stance. This worry continued through Safavid Persia and the Ottoman Empire, and you know, kind of importantly, interpersonally, there was little animosity throughout the classical and, uh, and early modern periods between Sunni and Shia intermarriage between sects, for example, uh, which is a, a measure that I kind of study, a lot throughout the paper remained high. Um, the contemporary sectarian divide, and characterized obviously by the Iranian-Saudi rivalry, grew out of you know, the power vacuum left by the United States as American troops left the Middle East um, throughout the Arab Spring. Okay, my research pointed to politically motivated actors in Riyadh and Tehran, uh, who painted uprisings in neighboring countries as threats to their sectarian control in one way or another, um, justifying violent responses to what were mostly peaceful or at least democratic revolutions. Um, for example, Saudi Arabia exerted influence over its Gulf neighbors, entering into protracted conflict in Yemen, especially after Sana fell to the Houthis um, Shia group in, in 2014. Um, and Bahrain in, in 2011 at Bosch, what the Saudis called um, a threat to the Sunni regime in, uh, in Manama. However, the, the actual sectarian natures of, of both conflicts are highly contested. Um, the sectarian divide is not new, as the history shows, but, but it also does not need to cloud all aspects of the modern Middle East. Um, in the 2018-19 Arab Barometer Survey, for example, 49% of Arab men and women replied that, that they believed regional sectarian tensions are due to, quote unquote, a political divide between politicians, um, as compared to, to only 25% who responded that, that they're due to a religious divide between Sunni and Shia. Um, history shows us that sectarianism can be overcome with both 
a reframing of issues as ones which require diplomatic or political responses as opposed to theological or sectarian ones, and an emphasis on issues on which the region can more or less work together, uh, greasing the wheels for diplomatic efforts elsewhere. The negative rhetoric rampant in the Middle East that blames every conflict on sectarianism has to be put to a halt, um, as is shown in Yemen and Bahrain, not every issue is a sectarian one, and regimes both in the Middle East and within NATO have to refrain from, from painting them as such. There are a number of issue areas through which cooperation is possible. Um, Israeli relations, which I mentioned earlier, Turkish relations, participation in regional cooperation groups, um, and religious diplomacy. And, you know, I think the, the history shows us that the, the solution to sectarianism um, is really the compartmentalization of, of issue areas. Um, you know, regional cooperation groups will not solve all crises, but they will decrease the likelihood that the crises are entrenched along confessional lines, for example. Um, you know, the future of the Middle East is uncertain, but, but a lack of leadership from the United States as it, as it pivots towards the Far East likely means that the struggle between Saudi and Iranian camps for hegemony will continue. It's unrealistic to expect that such a a great power struggle to, to cease, um, but the responsible reframing of that struggle is vital. Saudi Arabia and Iran's expansion in the region, I think, are limited um, because their sectarian posturing will never allow them to reach out to the populations necessary to grow and influence commensurate with their goals. Um, so reframing and, and shifting emphasis of issues, as I explained, will become necessary. Um, the Middle East is in a sectarian moment, but I think my research shows me that it, it is just that, a moment. Um, conflict will not stop as sectarianism wanes, of course, but the entrenchment of conflicts into protracted um, and region-wide and region -wide issues um, will be lessened. And, and I think that is worth every effort. I wanna ask you about some recent initiatives. Uh, uh, the uh, Emir of uh, the UAE has, has uh, put forward uh, um, the Declaration of Tolerance, which the Holy Father signed with the head of Al-Aqsa as well, and uh, now the Holy Father has met with Sistani. Uh, uh, do they represent a softening uh, or a possibility of softening of the, of, the, uh, uh, of the divide between Sunni and Shia? Yeah, the, thanks, Father Drew. It's a, a really good question. Um, of course, kind of the, the year of tolerance that um, Muhammad bin Zayed of, of you know, of, of the UAE has signed, it hasn't been so tolerant to the Iranians or the Qataris, um, mm -hmm, but, mm -hmm. but I do think, um, especially by extending his invitation to Pope Francis and, and, and Francis's um, acceptance of the invitation is coming to the Arabian Peninsula, um, he became the first sitting point of, to, to visit the, the, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and he you know, delivered a sermon that attracted more than 100,000 people, um, the largest Christian gathering on the peninsula in history. Um, and, and I think the inclusion of foreign religions, you know, quote unquote, foreign religions um, in diplomatic outreach decreases the taboo of, of interfaith dialogue. Um, it, it emphasizes the tolerance that is present person to person, community group to community group, in the region, um, and I think it links the Islamic world together as theological partners. So, so I do think it points to a softening. Um, you, I think you you also mentioned something in your uh, comment on my poster, which I thought was interesting. Um, the so the last the, the talks between Iran and Saudi Arabia, the secret talks that have become not so secret. Um, I think points to the pragmatism of the states. I mean, the, the conflict in Yemen uh, hasn't been successful for anyone, really, definitely not the Saudis, um, as they kind of face more pushback from, from the Biden administration. Um, so they can put the facade of deep religious hatred aside because it benefits them politically um, and pragmatically. So, so I do think that, and, and um, you know, the year of tolerance, which maybe hasn't been as tolerant as it could be, um, but is, is more tolerant than, than past years. 
um, I think it, it does point to a way forward. Um, yeah, the Emirates and Qatar kind of have a have a uh, a rivalry about about tolerance. They each have their own form of pluralism. So yeah. Yeah, and and interestingly enough, I mean, Iran has been um, at least theologically. Uh, they have the the dialogue between civilizations um, back in the 90s. Um, they've kind of been on the precipice of at least theological um, tolerance groups. Uh, so there is at least lip service paid to to that kind of work and and is is improving um, as that rivalry like like you mentioned grows. Thank you. Thank you. I'll let Catherine ask her question for Sam, and then we'll, if we have time after that, we'll open it up to anyone to ask questions of any of our participants. Great. Well, the implication of your argument is trying to shift the narrative uh, so that it moves away. And there clearly are different ways of doing that. One is leadership, but another is through education systems. So I'm interested in whether there are any positive examples of trying to work through education, public education or religious education in the region? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, my research pointed to specifically examples of the opposite of that. Um, you know, I think the most notable factors uh, contributing to that shift being the Iranian revolution in 1979 um, and the kind of the subsequent effort to export that revolution in Saudi Arabia's um, counter that and in kind of the getting even closer to Wahhabism and the rewriting of textbooks in Saudi Arabia um, to, to emphasize that um, from a positive perspective, what we mentioned, you know, kind of what Father Drew, Father Drew and I were just discussing um, this year of tolerance. Um, there has been, and I write about this a little bit, I don't have the exact examples um, or specifics, but in the, in, in the Gulf states, um, there has been a, a shift towards, specifically now with um, you know, the Abraham Accords and, and, and a de-emphasis of Israel, um, removing from education systems and, and public diplomacy, um, which I suppose can be a form of, of education, uh, the, the most negative of, of the rhetoric. Um, so it definitely has been used to, to entrench the conflict. Um, and I think it to your point, it, it can definitely be used to, to kind of wane its, uh, its detriments as well. We have eight minutes to open the floor up for any questions for anyone. Um, feel free to raise your hands, put questions in the chat. I see Paul, you have your hand up. Thank you, Brian. My question is for Catherine Murphy. I appreciated your um, presentation and the sophistication with which pretty complex material involving three different countries is dealt with in a small space. I have a question that might be even simpler than your approach. I guess my armchair sense is that in Poland and to a lesser degree in Hungary, the um, nationalist church-based right drives a lot of its authority simply from being on the right side of history in some simple way. The church uh, lined up against communism in the 80s. Communism fell. Human rights were associated with the church. Uh, much followed. And that there's a sentimental authority that these uh, churches derive from, from that experience. I'm wondering, A, if that's the case, and B, if it is, whether the it's useful to distinguish the experience in Ukraine from that because the fall of the Soviet Union was associated less with religious resistance and human rights and more with economic and bureaucratic factors. I'm painting with a broad brush here. I'm not an expert in the region, but it's a question that has pertinence for my own work and that's why I'm posing it to you. Uh, definitely, I think so, particularly in Poland with the solidarity movement and for another class I wrote a paper, I wrote two papers actually on that. Um, the Catholic Church was crucial in keeping solidarity alive. Um, it would hide solidarity members in their basements because even then in Poland like 
the Soviet Union troops wouldn't want to go into the churches because they knew it would spark like mass outrage for arresting these solidarity members when it was banned. Um, in Hungary, it's like a little different because not a ton of people are like practicing Christians, um, but a lot kind of associate with it. That's why Orban's had to frame it as like Christian culture because a lot of people are just much more comfortable with Christianity and like maybe their parents went to church or like they go to Easter service kind of. So he's framing it in more of a like religious culture, but not like as directly associated with a church as like in Poland versus in Ukraine religions like in my, from what I can tell, it's like a little different because it's become more of a, like an, a debate with Russia because orthodoxy is such a big component of it and historically Russia has been kind of the leader in like has controlled the orthodox church like to an extent and so that's why the creation of like the orthodox Ukrainian church was like such a big deal and like this huge unifying force in Ukraine even though like about like one third I think associates with the uh, church uh, so a significant portion doesn't, but like it's become this like nationalistic sign and people are trying to be like all brought together. Like, sorry, did that answer your question? It did in a way. And again, painting with a very broad brush, I'm just wondering if Ukraine is at a stage in religious terms that Poland was some time ago and that there's, can we see a general tendency of these, um, groups to uh, fight for social and religious space and after they've gained it um, take on authoritarian uh, and rigid tendencies kind of in a triumphalist way that it depends on having this historical victory that then um, s sours the whole thing and that since that victory is not as pronounced in Ukraine the uh, relative um, liberalism of the Ukrainian movement might um, be traceable in fact in part to that. I mean, quite possibly, you can kind of argue that what's happening in Ukraine feels a little similar to what happened in Poland with solidarity, like, what was it, 30 years ago? So maybe, hopefully, it stays, like, liberal and democratic, but we don't really know how it's going to end up. I think you could definitely argue something like that. We'll be watching. Thanks so much. Of course. Thank you. Go ahead, Maggie. Yeah, Go ahead and ask your question. I didn't want to interrupt anything before. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, so my question is, there have been calls to address climate refugees through attaching them to pre-existing refugee criteria, and in a way, avoiding fundamental changes to a core convention while also addressing political concerns of states with large domestic um, climate denial regimes, um, and among other things. And yeah, so I was yeah. ultimately wondering, what do you think would be the consequences of this, attaching them to pre-existing definitions? And do you think the international community would gain anything in creating a specific category of climate refugees? That is so interesting. Um, I think like I could totally see like there being, you know, pitfalls and drawbacks to both. Like I think kind of, I guess the danger of like expanding it to everyone is then like define like having to define like the impacts of climate change and like we don't know if down the road if climate change is going to get so extreme that um like there are other impacts that might come up and then those people can't kind of get protection because we almost like worded it too specifically if that makes sense and i think like i think there does need to be a difference between like people that are persecuted on the basis of religion and people that like are displaced due to climate change. But I still think like the people displaced due to climate change should still be offered protections. I think you kind of have to like walk the line there. I, I mean, most like most of like laws are very vague so they can be like applied in like many situations. And I think that's kind of what needs to happen here. I think like to start obviously like the 1950 refugee convention is so like, like it just doesn't mention climate refugees or climate change at all. But so you'd have to kind of walk that line of like saying like, 
these are the impacts now of climate change and like these people should be protected but like not defining it too much where like some people who maybe are legitimate climate refugees can't get that protection or vice versa where like people who don't really need that protection who maybe like they have a puddle like in their driveway or something like can get protection or like I don't know something like that um so yeah I think that's what I would say to that but that's a great question Maggie thank you thank you so much well, we are at time. Um, I would like to thank all of you so much for participating today, um, especially those who made it to the morning and afternoon sessions. As a reminder, we have all of our posters posted on our website and you should feel free to keep the conversation going in the comments on our website. So thank you all so much. I hope you have a wonderful Friday afternoon.